Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elisa Sairol. I'm also a member of the group of uh, image and video processing. And like all of us now, we are, I'm working on deep learning. And one of the topics that I'm dealing with is medical imaging. And today I'm going to give a I mean, an, an overview uh, of, of this topic and then some examples of works done by some of the professors and students of, of the group. So uh, just let me see that in, oops. Is it working now? Do you know if there is a, a, a command to a click here? Yeah. Was it there yesterday or no? It was here this morning? No? Sí. I'll stay here. <laughs> okay, so just to tell that uh, I, myself with Veronica, we work together and she's also working a lot in, uh, actually she works exclusively on medical imaging and some other members of the team also work on medical imaging. And uh, first I will explain uh, why uh, deep learning for medical imaging, then some of the challenges that uh, we, have, we have to face if we are working in images in medical imaging, uh, and then some of these applications that, that I show you. So let's see that uh, if you want to know a little bit more about this, this <gasps> I forgot, <laughs> about this topic, you may go to this uh, to this survey, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a recent one, but it's very well explained what are the different uh, problems that you have to face, the different applications. And also in this uh, survey, you're going to see that uh, how the use of, uh, of um, medical imaging and um, medical informatics, uh, here it's only 2015, but you will see that it grows a lot, and especially medical imaging. And also, if you go to medical imaging per se, you will see that also it's growing a lot. And uh, the use of CNNs, of convolutional neural networks, is the one that has more impact on, in research on medical imaging. Uh, so it's a hot topic of application of deep learning. And one of the, the most uh, uh, popular applications is magnetic uh, resonance imaging, especially uh, images of uh, 3D from the brain. But you also have some, uh, a lot of applications in, in images taken by the microscope, uh, from the blood, from different tissues. So from observing uh, uh, images from the microscope, you can take also a lot of uh, information. Also computer tromography. Uh, in, uh, instead of magnetic resonance, it's taken in, with X-rays, and actually you have 2D X-rays and ultrasounds. And uh, with low energy X-rays, you have mammographies. You may have other kinds of uh, modalities to obtain the images. And finally, the, the last one, which was very popular because one of the first topic to, to be uh, successful with uh, deep learning was in color fundus photos, which are photographs taken from the back of the, of the eye. Um, well, so these are the main uh, applications. Uh, I mean, modalities of the images, but from here, uh, which are the areas? So the, the most common one are to take pathologies. Um, pathologies, that the classical example would be 
uh, images from microscopy, uh, observing the tissues or, or blob, or obtaining uh, uh, bacteria or, or viruses, or um, from the from the blood, or observing the cells. But also uh, the second application is from uh, MRI images of the brain to detect tumor to analyze possible impacts of Alzheimer in, in the brain. You can also, uh, other applications are, are images from the lung, the lungs, uh, uh, from the abdomen through the, mm, I mean, to observe the different uh, parts of the abdomen, the, the heart, the breast. Uh, in the abdomen you will have uh, uh, the organs, the liver, the stomach, uh, etc. And also breast, also images from, from the bones, see fractures and so on. And as, as I was mentioned also from the eye to, to observe the possible uh, problems in the retina. Uh, the kind of algorithms that uh, you may apply to these uh, 2D or 3D images are range from, from segmentation, if you want, uh, for example, to uh, uh, extract the position and, and to recognize where you have an organ in one of these images, or within an organ to segment where you have uh, a lesion within this organ. You may also want to not to segment, per, but to detect uh, some parts, for example, a lesion in this case, but not uh, necessarily to have the segmentation. Uh, you may have problems of uh, classification. For example, say uh, this image has uh, skin cancer or not, just to say yes or not. So that uh, exam classification will be a binary decision. If it's not binary, then we can we may classify uh, types of cancers or types of different uh, pathologies, uh, which you only need to classify. Okay, and other tasks would be, for example, uh, to do registration uh, from MRI images. You have uh, different uh, projections, uh, so you may want which give different information, you may want to, to see the correspondence, the correspondence of the voxels of the pixels if you take uh, different images. So it's also an important problem. You may also want to enhance images or uh, to combine information from your images to some uh, other type of uh, uh, information, like say, what if, if the image that you are seeing it co be belongs to a male or a female, or it's from a young person, an old person, or uh, the exposures to some uh, uh, illness, depending on where you live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you may combine images with uh, other information to to extract or to take decisions. So. Uh, this area of application of deep learning or in computer vision in general, uh, it's cha challenging, challenging in the following sense. Uh, one is that uh, uh, regarding uh, the way we work, engineers versus the way uh, medical doctors work and see the importance of what uh, it's, it's, it's the information per se. So, one thing that could be important for us is not important for the medical doctor or vice versa. So we need to, to, um, to gather and have a, a lot of discussions and conversation to know e even e what is the goal because you say, oh, yes, I understood, but maybe you didn't understood what the medical doctor was saying. Also another challenging problem is that uh, the physiology of uh, of a human uh, person, which, uh, mm, for example, the shape of the liver or the sh shape of the brain uh, or the, the, the way you're, you're, a person can develop a tumor is 
very different from one person to the other. So these differences of uh, physiology make it uh, difficult to, to even to annotate images, to, to make predictions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as, uh, regarding this topic, uh, uh, it's also uh, difficult to, okay, the, the, the medical doctor gives you instructions, but it's difficult to get from these uh, instructions of the medical doctor to uh, afterwards, we have to program something. So what, what, how can you pass this uh, valuable information to something that can afterwards uh, work? Um, also, sometimes <coughs> you talk to two different doctors and they have contra contradictory opinions. So that's a very challenging <laughs> problem, especially if you are in front of two doctors that say opposite things. So that's, that's terrible. <laughs> Uh, another thing is that uh, sometimes the deep, lear deep learning is like a black box. You don't know what's happening there. And uh, um, that makes that some doctors say, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I cannot understand what this uh, box is doing. Even sometimes for some legal purposes, you have to describe and give an analytical description of your algorithm. And if it's a black box, it's uh, complicated. And this creates some lack of confidence on, on the algorithm. So this is a challenging uh, uh, regarding this problem definition and expertise, but also uh, it's also challenging regarding the data because uh, many times uh, you have data sets, but these data sets are not annotated. And, uh, and if you want experts to annotate it, they say, okay, they give you the data, they maybe annotate a couple of images, and then you, you spend one month going after the medical doctor saying, please, uh, can you annotate this? And uh, sometimes it's uh, challenging to, to get uh, uh, annotated uh, images from, from experts. And uh, also, you see that uh, sensors are different. Different sensors can give you with this, through the same image different uh, different results and sometimes uh, uh, there is a class imbalance uh, especially when you are uh, segmenting uh, tissues or images where maybe uh, the the lesion or what you it's of interest is very small and you have a huge background and, and what you need to know it's 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 uh, very small, so this creates a class imbalance, especially when, when doing uh, segmentation, or sometimes uh, when it's a binary decision, you also have a lot of uh, negatives or and, and very few positives. So it's a problem that you also have to face with. So let's go now to some uh, examples, and the first one is from. Uh, uh, brain uh, tumor segmentation from MRI images where you may have uh, uh, different, you have the 3D, uh, uh, the 3D uh, data and usually to visualize you take some slices which can be axial, coronal or sagittal and from those images some, you usually may uh, mark where you have the lesion. Let's see more exactly uh, an example. So in MRI, as I say, you have uh, from the same sensor, you get uh, different types of uh, images, uh, which is uh, why it's called multimodal MRI images. Depending on, on the information, T1, T2, flare, you see that the, the image that is uh, formed is uh, a little bit different, but so you have to register them and you can use uh, the information in all of them to localize the tumor. So here you have uh, uh, this example where you have uh, like the, the large area where is the, the tumor, uh, which is called the, the edema, and then the, the non-hensing solid core, which is the red area, 
and then here you have the, the core, which is the blue one, and in the middle, the green one, which is the necrotic uh, uh, part of the tumor. So this would be an example of uh, uh, one problem where you have to do the segmentation and detect these uh, four areas, for example. So uh, with uh, Veronica, she has been working a lot in this topic and uh, also in Alzheimer images and like she, she we participated in a, one challenge to detect this tumor and we applied different architectures. So uh, you will see in general the architectures are well known for you, but uh, the thing here is to apply it to this kind of, of problems, okay? So you, you will see a network which is it's instead of 2D, it's a 3D extension of a fully convolutional network. A very popular uh, second choice was to use a a UNet or a VNet, which is a kind of network for segmentation in medical imaging that it's uh, used a lot. I don't know if you, you, someone else maybe has told you, okay. And uh, then there was some network which was uh, in 2D and uh, not very complicated, but that gave good results, okay. so. I will go fast to these networks because, as I was telling, I want to stress the application, not the architectures per se. And uh, so here you see uh, this uh, three, 3D three uh, network where uh, skip connections uh, were used, as you can see in this uh, network that this is the depth uh, uh, network and you take uh, skip connections in in a couple of places and, and then you use all this information to generate the, the 3D map. This is the classical uh, uh, UNET. So also with this, uh, the up sampling and uh, down sampling and up sampling uh, uh, branches and with uh, skip connections that uh, give, as you know, uh, the details of uh, high resolution in the upper uh, layers and the low resolution with more uh, information of global information in the down layers. Okay, so this was the third, the second option. And the third one was something which uh, used a combination of uh, classical uh, architecture with upsampling and uh, an upper block, which did a, a large, uh, um, I mean, a unique step on, on this uh, on this part, and you use you unite both branches and get also uh, a prediction of the 3D segmentation. And here are some of of the results uh, in in different uh, projections, just to. Uh, see that the measures that were used were accuracy, die score, precision, recall, okay? And uh, the die score is kind of a intersection over union. Here you have a class. This measure is quite used in, in medical imaging in segmentation. And uh, you, could, you, you could see the, the comparisons of, of the three of the three uh, networks with the, the different projections and you can compare with the, with the ground truth, okay? And, and this network works better than, than the other two. Uh, well, you can go to the, the paper if you want to have more details on, on the value that you have here. And uh, well, let's change completely off topic. This was uh, uh, a problem to, you have a, a, an image of, of the skin and you have some areas of the skin that can have a, a sun, they are burned by the sun, sun exposed uh, skin. But not all, I mean you have a, a, a data set with the images of sun exposure and some uh, 
of them did not have this sun exposure, so it was uh, a binary decision. And uh, the problem here was uh, that these uh, images are high resolution, they are huge, and uh, you have to divide the image in patches. So uh, uh, it's very also common in, in a medical image to, to divide the very high resolution images in, in patches. And here they, uh, they were studying the way to take these patches and how, how, the, how is the, the selection of patches to decide which uh, images were uh, sun, sun exposed uh, uh, images of the skin uh, using also uh, an algorithm which is based on multiple instant learning to decide uh, to decide if these uh, images were sun exposed. So, uh, so the main idea is this: how you select these patches, and uh, mm, like they were compared just to do a, a regular grid sampling, uh, taking the, cent the centroid of the patches uh, using a uniform distribution, or doing a Monte Carlo sampling, and. Uh, and the results of uh, classification of this binary classification were better, uh, I mean, we're betting for training, uh, uh, for the training accuracy, but of course the, the, that counts, what counts is when you use validation or test accuracy, and this way of sampling patches was, was a better one. Let's go to another problem as the ones that we have seen in this classification. So we have seen 3D segmentation, uh, a binary decision, uh, classification. So this one is like an enhancement of images where you have to, uh, from low resolution images to uh, obtain high or higher or super resolution images, okay? So uh, for this purpose, you use a, a GAN network. Um, and it works in the following way. So for the discriminator part of the GAN, you, you, your input is either a super resolution image or a true high resolution image. And the, the discriminator has to decide if this is, uh, is super resolution or high resolution, OK? And uh, the loss function for, for the discrimination is the least squares. And for the GAN, uh, for the generator, you use a, 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 a set of convolutional uh, layers where you have uh, several uh, skip connections around. I mean, you use uh, residual, residual blocks. And then you have uh, three different ways to do the upsample to, to get at the end a super resolution image, okay? So either you use a, a, like a nearest neighbor uh, upsampling and then you use convolutions or directly you, like, it's like you were using a, a sub-pixel upsampling. It's, uh, uh, like having, uh, using directly some filters at sub-pixel uh, precision, but through, uh, I mean, deconvolutional uh, layers. And uh, these three uh, possible ways to, to do the discrimination were compared to just doing like an interpolation, a cubic interpolation. And, and here a couple of, uh, of two different upsamplings were tested, like upsampling by two or upsampling by four. And, and you can see, uh, I mean, here's, as I say, it's the interpolation and, and here the three uh, proposed solutions to get this super resolution image. And uh, you could see that, uh, I mean, regarding PSNR, the subpixel using uh, uh, the third solution 
was the one that, with near neighbors, was the one that gave better results. But if you go to this um, uh, other measure for similarity, the uh, resize uh, upsampling uh, with neighbors, neighbors and then convolution was give, giving a better value of this similarity measure. Okay, so this is another application for medical imaging. Let's see another segmentation uh, uh, example. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take five more minutes. <laughs> Uh, so here, well, the, the goal was to do the segmentation of a lesion in a, in a liver from computer tomo tomography images. So the, the proposal that Miria uh, gave was to, to do first a liver segmentation, that is first to localize where in this computer tomography you have the, the liver. And as you can see, I don't know if I have it in the pro, but you have like a convolutional, uh, different layers of convolutional neural networks. And also you, at the end, you take different resolutions, you upsample and you add. Okay, so you also take skip connections to form the segmentation of the liver. And uh, this information together with uh, uh, some uh, information uh, which was uh, using bounding boxes uh, to detect or to localize where you have uh, uh, these uh, lesions uh, are located. Okay, so uh, I think it w if it was more than 50% of pixels are have a lesion, you, these are uh, positive if they are not uh, uh, they, they don't have any pixel, uh, less than 50% of pixels are f of the liver lesion, so they are negative, okay? So you also train it here a, a deep neural network together to, to the liver segmentation to at the end using this information to obtain uh, the segmentation of the lesion, okay? So this was the topic that uh, well here is the, the detection of of the of the lesion tissues and uh, here were some results they were not incredible but uh, uh, they improved a little bit previous the, the the baseline okay the the segmentation of the liver is used by the third network to do back propagation only on those uh, areas where you have liver, so so it's a way in uh, um, it's a way to cope with the class unbalance that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so so this was only using segmentation. This is using the detector of bad tissue or, or good tissue, and this was using a, a post processing of conditional random fields. Well, this is also an example of, uh, this is a microscope uh, image uh, where you have some parasites, which are the parasite of leishmaniosis, and you have to detect if the images have this parasite, and if the parasites are in the, in the, uh, in, inside the cell or outside the cell, okay? And, uh, well, it, it was using a, a unit, I will go fast and the results, well, well, this was the annotation tool and some of the results are, are here, okay? So it's using the UNET. We use also the UNET to, to detect uh, the bacilli of the tuberculosis in sputum samples. Uh, and we are working still with this problem right now. Uh, and just uh, other, I have a couple more of examples. This one was, uh, uh, it's interesting because it's a way, as I said, we don't have, one of the challenges of medical images is that we don't have so many annotated images. So, uh, so to cope with this, with this problem, 
one of the things that may be done is, okay, we use a, a first iteration of one algorithm that gives classifications, and the ones that have, uh, that have high certainty uh, of being from one class or from another class, this can be automatically labeled. And those which are near the, I mean, in a binary problem, that you are close to being from one class to the other, those can those have a uncertain um, probability, so this can be loved by, by humans. This, uh, in this paper, uh, they also talk about uh, uncertainty maps. So these maps uh, can be, there are so many ways to generate uncertainty maps, and one of them is to generate inferences, different, uh, different uh, outputs of inferences, but using dropout. So every time the, your image goes through, through the network, the, since the dropout has a maybe high uh, probability to use some neurons or others, the result is different, okay? And I mean, it, it, it might be different. The, the thing is that it is different in those regions where the algorithm has some uncertainty. So you, usually when you have to segment some images, you, usually you are very certain. The result is always the same, uh, maybe in the inside, it's always the same in the background, but you have areas where depending on the inference of your dropout, uh, the algorithm doesn't know if it's belong to the to the background or to the, or to the object that you are trying to segment, okay? And this information can, can be used also for this active learning. And uh, uh, well, you, you have, if you look at the paper, some comparisons between this active learning model and the, and the true level and see how uh, you can get better and better uh, results. And the last uh, example, it's a very simple one. It's only using a VGG, but the thing is that uh, usually when you train and you label, you use, you might think that you're going to use the perfect segmentation of your object. But sometimes it's better not only use the perfect segmentation, but the area which is around the object you want to, to, to detect, okay? And in this paper, they use different, uh, I mean, you have the perfect segmentation object, but you may have a contour area around the object. And you can see that uh, in this paper, they show that it's better to leave this region around the object to, to get better, in this case, this, mm, this parameter sensory accuracy or <coughs> area on the curve, okay? This, so this was another application. So uh, just this is the end of my, of my topic. If you want to know more, you can contact me, Xavi or Veronica. And uh, you may also check these uh, links of data sets, challenges. This is maybe this Mikai conference, uh, very well known for uh, the famous one to, to apply your papers if you want to work in that field and to look for papers here too to work on that, okay? So that's it. <laughs> I know it's very compressed, but uh, it was just to give you an overview and the, the applications that you may find. So any question? <laughs> no? Okay, so I'll leave the, the word to Kevin. Yeah, I think it's tough, yeah. yeah.